last lecture, I discussed the general problems of scientific knowledge and whether they, whether they occurred in any of the sciences. And as you saw, most of the, the, the people I mentioned come out of physics and, or philosophy. And that's to be expected because um, these problems were first uh, broached in physics, starting in basically the 17th century. So they go way back. So the question becomes for biology, what is the particular type of structures, the particular kind of knowledge that, that one has in biology? And, and that's a real, that's a serious issue because um, it, it appears to me that biology is quite, is a bit unsure of what it studies. In fact, you have many discussions, you have discussions, what are we, uh, people arguing about what we're studying, okay? I actually don't think the problem is that complicated. It's not trivial, but it's not that complicated. The question is, to get at the kind of structures, the kind of form, the kind of relationships that one looks at in biological science. And that's what this uh, discussion will be about, cells and factories. It's basically discussing the, um, the analogies uh, between cells and factories. And uh, okay. so biology concerns life. If it doesn't concern life, it doesn't, it's not really of interest to us. And so biology studies living systems. And life, now here's the point. Life exists within the physical world, so biology depends upon physics. Without physics, you wouldn't have biology. Biology requires physics as a substrate. And since molecules form the building blocks, biology depends upon chemistry. Okay, but it's not chemistry. Chemistry deals only with molecules. Biology concerns the operation of the cell in its pursuit of life. That's the critical statement, in its pursuit of life, not the molecular infrastructure that forms the physiochemical underpinnings of life. Now, that's an important difference. If it's just the underpinnings, then it's physics or chemistry. We don't need biology. But these are living systems, and therefore it's the lifeness of the system or the livingness of the system uh, that matters to us. And this is the key issue. And I'll start with a very old quote uh, from Conrad Waddington, one of the premier biologists in history, certainly of the 20th century. And he wrote this in 1935. So make sure you keep that date in mind, because it's the key date, in some sense, to this talk. The processes which keep an animal alive have to be quite as highly organized as the operations in the most complicated mass production factory. That's the statement. If there was a secret life, and by secret life he means what livingness is, okay, not just molecules. It is here we must look for it, among the causes which bring about the arrangement of innumerable separate processes into a single harmonious living organism. Okay. No one can write in a more clear-cut, concise statement the definition of biology and what it's to be doing. Okay? And also at what the structure of its knowledge should look like, okay? That of a factory. Now, that's a good thing, because we know a lot about factories. Factories we've been studying for many years. We have an enormous amount of stored knowledge about the kinds of structures that biology must have in order to exist as a subject concerning life. If I get this right. Ah, amazing. Okay. Um, this slide, I think, is key. Non-systems biology is an oxymoron. There's no such thing as non-systems biology, because life involves systems. Roddington again. To say that an animal is an organism means, in fact, two things. Firstly, that it is a system. 1935, he wrote this, made up of separate parts. And secondly, that in order to describe fully how any one part works, one has to refer either to the whole system or to the other parts. In other words, there is no non-Sipson's biology. And Martington makes that quite clear in 1935. He defines what biology is, he defines its subject matter, and he says what it requires to study it, all in about eight lines. Okay? And these are my comments. Okay? <laughs> At its root, biology concerns systems. This is a deduction from Waddington. There is no such thing as non-Sipson's biology, at least in the modern sense of science. Now, I don't mean just recording data. Below the systems level is where we have physics and chemistry. Now, let me comment about Waddington. If you read, as I read anyway, um, biology paper, 
I often felt that I was taking a trip through the 18th and 19th centuries. I didn't feel I was in the 20th century. Okay? And in fact, I'm not the only one who feels this way. I've talked to other people who have gone into biology, let's say, from engineering. And, and you, feel, you feel you're moving backwards in time. But then you read Waddington. And here you truly have a 20th century mind. You know, in, in philosophy, uh, it's been said that when you read Hume, you, re you reach modernity. In other words, before Hume, you don't really have a modern mind. Everybody has one foot left in the medieval period. Okay? But with Hume, you leave that. And you enter modernity. He's a modern mind. And, and Kant has a modern mind. In Waddington, you have a truly modern mind. If you read him, you pick it up. Now, in 1935, he was writing about systems. He's missing the mathematical structure. First of all, he's not a mathematician. But second of all, the mathematics of systems hadn't been developed. It was being developed in the 30s in the Soviet Union and the United States. So as he was writing this in biology, the precise mathematical structures and formalisms that needed for biology were being developed, both, in, in, as I said, in the Soviet Union and in the United States. Uh, the key person I would put there was Norbert Wiener in the United States. Norbert Wiener was um, changing this. In fact, the key, statements about, the key statement about biology, which I'll give, comes from Norbert Wiener. And somehow, since after Waddington, modernity has left. When you read biology papers, in fact, it can be worse. I often feel like I've gone back to Aristotelian times when I read data mining. Data mining is pre-Galileo. At least serious biology has hypotheses, it has tests, it has wonderful experiments. You see beautiful experiments in history of biology, brilliant experiments, e equivalent in, in talent and, and genius to those you see in physics. Okay? Waddington in particular did very interesting experiments. It doesn't reach the 20th century without Waddington because you don't have systems. Okay? But when you go to data mine, then you were way back. I felt like I was back before Galileo. That's why in my papers I use the term pre-Galilean to describe the subject. There are no hypotheses. There are no experiments. There's no science, OK? This is, at least in the modern sense. You go back to Aristotle, observations, random observations, recording the observations, looking for explanations, but no science. So in some sense, from Waddington, you drift backwards into the 19th century. And then as you move into the 1990s and 2000, you go back to Aristotle. You go back into the 16th century. Things are going backwards, OK? It's remarkable reading papers in biology now with data mining. There's no biology. Not even a cent of it, biology. Okay, right? That's a problem. That's a real problem. There's no medicine in it. There's not a fact. There's not anything. In it. There's simply vacuums, complete collections of data. Someone runs a clustering algorithm, draws a few pretty pictures, and publishes a paper. It means absolutely nothing, zero. Not any content. Not some content. There was absolutely no content in a modern scientific sense. Then read Waddington. Your, your mind becomes alive. Wonderful to read. So all the students, anybody who wants to go into biology, forget the newer pa papers. Go back and read Waddington. He will excite you because he truly represents the mind. He, is the, he has a mind of his time. He's with Wiener. Okay? He's, with the, he's with the great physicists of the period. His mind is alive. Okay? And he sees the problems. These quotes I've just given are just, just a, a bit okay, coming from Waddington. He understood what had to be done. Okay. And he is basically, in our book, he's the guiding figure when it comes to biological uh, uh, comments. Now, what are factories? The hardware units do not constitute the factory. They're necessary, but these are not part of the factory. These are only part of the factory. They can be used for anything. You can have computers. You can have relays. You can have robots. So what? Okay, they can be anywhere. They're not, the factory is more than that. They only become part of the factory when their functioning is integrated within the whole. Then they become part of the factory. Otherwise, it's junk. Go through, it, go through an old factory, which has sort of been half taken apart, and it looks like junk. It's nothing work, nothing's running. The regulatory logic is the essence of the factory. It is what remains if you strip away all the components, robots, computers, etc. What's left is the regulatory logic the logic that governs the integrated behavior of the factory. Okay. What about cells? Well, the molecules do not constitute the living cell. Functioning of transcription factors is a subject for chemistry, just as the electrical impulses carrying instructions to the robots are a subject for physics. 
I need to study them. As an engineer, I need to know them. But they're not part of my subject matter. As a biologist, you certainly have to know about transcription factors. And you certainly have to know as much as you can. But they're not your subject matter. Okay? One can list all molecular interactions and be virtually no closer to the livingness of the cell. Okay? The regulatory logic, just like with a factory, is the essence of the cell. Uh, think of a computer instruction set. With a computer instruction set, you have a list, you have, it's the same thing. You have a list of interactions providing the operations that the regulatory logic organizes into a functioning system. Just because you know the operations as a list, what are you going to do with it? It doesn't tell you what to do. It's just a bunch of log logical statements. It's when it's organized by the operating system to function that it becomes part of the actual uh, fun system, functioning system. Now, let's look at some of the properties of that. If we accept the fact that the factory is the model, the organization of the parts, what are we looking at? First of all, we're looking at random, stochasticity. A factory must handle random events. There's external interrupts all the time. There's internal component failure going on on a regular basis. And there's loss of demand. Factory has to respond to the down less demand. Just can't keep producing when it doesn't need to produce. It might get a tumor. <laughs> it's got to. It's got to face the fact that it doesn't have a demand. Okay. The operational program must adjust to random events to maintain proper function. If it can't, the factory will soon get out of out of sync with what it needs to do, and it will simply fail. There are many latent variables, and these give rise to stochasticity, stochasticity also. Stochasticity also. You may characterize certain variables in the factory into a simple part of the system, but there are many other variables operating all over the place, which are affecting the factory. What about stale stochasticity? Same. A stale must handle random events. Stress, I'll give six examples. Stress response, environmental insults, cellular malfunctions. We could go on and on and on to all the random events that are happening to a cell. A cell has to handle many, many more random events than a factory. It requires much greater ability to handle these events than a factory. And think of a living organism, what it has to handle. Regulation must adjust to random events. This is critical. Critical. And it's missing in much, if you look at much of the biological literature, it's missing. The interpretation of damage is conditioned by interactions with different genes present in different cell types. You, you simply don't have reaction you simply, to random events in a certain fixed given way. It has to adapt to various conditions, okay? The cell doesn't just react in a given way to a given stimulus, okay? It reacts depending on the conditions of the cell and other cells. Again, you have latent variables giving rise to stochasticity. Cell modeling must incorporate this latent. If you try to model a cell and leave out this, the fact that there's other variables outside the system affecting it, you might get a very nice deterministic model of the cell, for example, a nice set of differential equations. But they won't describe the cell very well, because they're going to be only representing a piece of the cell. So they, the, that model is going to appear random. Even though it's deterministic, the data will make it look random, because that data is being affected by other factors. And we face that all the time in data. So when you interpret the data, you have to keep this in mind. Now, why do we talk about? We have multivariate inputs. You don't have a single effect, effect resulting from a cause, OK? You don't have that kind of situation, that cause and effect, as I ruled that out last time. You have complicated interactive multivariate regulation. Let's look at P53, OK? When you have damage, DNA damage, OK, P53 is going to become activated. But there are all other kinds of inputs, and these are just a few of them, into P53. MDM2 will, will downrate, will, will cause deactivation of P53. This sequence of events could lead to activation of P53. Here's a pathway. So P53 is involved in lots and lots of actions, and it has to produce transcription factors, a transcription to cause translation, but it's going to depend upon all these inputs, and there are, plus other inputs. So if you try to fixate on any one of these inputs, and you do an experiment which says, I only have a single input, you're going to go wrong. You're going to go wrong. It's going to be conditioned. And the key word is conditioned. It's going to be conditioned on many, many factors. Okay? Now, the failure of P53, of course, is very bad. The failure can be a result of many, many different factors and interactions of factors. 
Okay? It may not be a failure of one thing, and that's the kind of network I showed last week. We have to somehow get at those relationships and try to represent those relationships in a some kind of multivariate network structure so that we can then try to interpret and understand how 53 is behaving. Okay? This is not an easy problem, but it's very similar to a factor, okay? except a very complicated factor. What's another problem we face? These are problems we face. Another problem we face is asynchronicity. In a synchronous system, you can assume there's a clock, and everything is happening in a discrete time. Okay? Why do you do that? Because you have delays, and delays in an electronic system hold up the action, so everything can only, everything happens randomly in some kind of interval. But then it only then you have the next time time increment, and then all things sort of come, they stabilize again and again. And you have this in a computer system. So you have a clock, zero, and t tau two tau, three tau, et cetera, whatever tau is, describing that time interval. That's not what you have in a cell. You have an asynchronous system. Multiple inputs are often required for a decision, and transitions take place when all necessary inputs have arrived. OK. You require, let's say, two, trans two transcription factors. Chemistry is not working on a clock. The chemistry is working at the, at the rates of the, whatever, whatever Physics is, or physics is controlling those reactions, okay? And they are random, and they are different. You have different processes running under different uh, timescales, okay? Why is this? What are, what are the properties of such a system? Well, it's much more efficient. It's much more efficient. You get response as quickly as possible. There are no delays to the response. The response comes when the, when, when the inputs have arrived. It's much more difficult to regulate much more difficult to regulate. The logic regulating a cell is far more complicated than a computer. Now, how do we know that? Because in the 1980s and earlier, people studied what are called data flow computers. Data flow computers are asynchronous computers. They proved to be extremely difficult to deal with. Okay? I remember when I was back in those days, I, was, I, I thought, oh, this is a great field to go into. I actually looked into it for a while. And of course, no one was getting anywhere. The problem is programming such a thing and controlling such a thing. It's all right to write it down and on a piece of paper, but actually do, doing it is a whole other story, OK? And this is the way the cell is functioning. It's functioning in a way that we have failed to achieve. Think of that, OK? So we know we have a difficult problem here. It's doing exactly what we have been unable to do, OK? It requires extremely complex regulatory control, and that's what really puts us in trouble. Now, what do we do? Often we take an asynchronous system and approximate it by a synchronous system to make it tractable. We have to do that. We will have to do that. We will have to approximate somehow this asynchronicity by an asynchronous system. But it may be a very complex system where there are various processes running at different time scales. Okay? Because some pathways are operating over minutes and some over hours. And we're going to have to somehow align those. And believe me, this is not an easy problem. Ask any engineer who's worked on these problems. He will tell you they are very hard. Not impossible. Now, why are we having this problem? Because we have transcription factors, OK? And I'm going to have to move out here. What we're going to have, ah. Okay. Here we're going to have um, cis regulatory machinery for some, uh, some DNA sequence. And we're going to try to, we're going to have to receive transcription factor A, I hope I can read this diagram, and transcription factor B in order to Get, a, get an activation, OK? And so we get output. Some of the output goes out to cell functions. Some of the output cycles back in to be transcription factors. These will arrive at random time intervals, OK? This looks exactly like the diagram of a data flow computer, OK? These things are arriving at random time intervals. And so if you try to use a clock, you're, you're, you're going to miss it, OK? And this, this pathway could be running in a different time scale than that pathway, much faster and much slower. Right? Second of all, there is amount of time to have, have degradation and also to leave, leave the system. So there are queuing issues arriving here, which we've studied and we've also studied engineering. This is a queuing process. We have to have several arrival processes. Then they have to be, they have to be processed here. That takes some random amount of time. 
And then we, have, we may have this cycle continuing. So you build up, you, you, you build up cues of transcription factors, in a sense, not in a line like you would at a shopping center, but you have, it, it, you, have the chem, you have the chemicals in there, the molecules are there, and they're sort of floating around. We've, we face these problems. Now, I'll tell you where these problems come from. They were addressed enormously in the 1950s and 60s um, at Bell Labs. And you had some of the best people in the world working on them. And most of the problems were mathematically attractive. If you look back to that period and see the results, almost everything has been done by simulation. Okay, I once had a professor from that period. And I asked him one time, where are the theorems? He said, we tried them. We couldn't get them. <laughs> okay? So much of the work was done by simulation. Of course, they had very slow computers back then. But these problems are very difficult. We also have something which is very puzzling if you, it, and troublesome. We have a lot of marginal knowledge. Now, statisticians are familiar with marginal knowledge. They know that if you look at one or two variables, and, you look, and you're not looking at the other variables which are relevant, you're going to get a distribution which does not represent what's going on in the system. We work with pathways. A pathway represents a trace of activity, not a dynamical not a dynamical trajectory in the full state space. A pathway just shows one gene, another gene, protein, et cetera. It doesn't show the multivariate influences going on at the same time. It shows successors, not multivariate logic. What I just showed you in those transcription factors doesn't appear because a, a pathway will simply show you a sequence of activities. And it's a, a cursed tribute activity can be misleading. Pathways can be very misleading. At TGEM, we're very interested in studying pathways and trying to validate them, and then when they fail, try to adjust them into more complete logic. Because we take pathways, for example, we're interested in uh, tumor pathways, um, and those pathways that are in the literature tend not to work under experimental conditions, and the reason is, is they're too simplified. Our goal is to try to enrich them and try make them into more complete networks. Cell regulation is contextual. That's another big problem. The logic depends upon signals representing the state of the cell. In other words, the logic that's applied in the operation of the cell depends on other state variables which give you the state of the system. And I'll talk about that more momentarily. So that the same variables, you may look at them and you may say, this gene is upregulated, this gene is downregulated, gene C is upregulated, therefore such and such should happen. No. There are other state variables which are determining how those three genes affect the rest of the system. Sometimes 101 can cause one response. Sometimes 101 may cause an opposite response. The reason because the state of the system is different, and you're not looking at the state variables which are determining the state of the system. Okay. In general, the correlation of a control gene with its contextually controlled targets is only evident when the controller is in the proper context. OK, you have a gene which is controlling a pathway or several pathways. In certain contexts, that control will be effective. In other contexts, that control will not be effective. Okay. This can be extremely confusing because if you don't know what context you're in, you won't know the effect of the control. So when you, want to, when you want to initiate a pathway, the initiation of that pathway may be different under different, scenario, different, setting, different contexts of the cell, different conditions. If it's under stress, for instance, okay, this can change. Okay? And there are genes like this, which I'll talk about, like such as DUSK1, which are, which, are, which are very involved in these kind of processes. That may be my next slide, let me see. Not my next slide, but it's one of my slides. Okay. Um, the next problem of a factory and cellular locality. Hierarchical control has many disadvantages, major disadvantages. Suppose you want to control a factory from one, from one location and send out all signals around you. Okay? What happens? It's very inefficient because it cannot respond quickly to changing conditions. Okay? Think, of, think of trying to manage the military in Vietnam from the White House. This is what happened in the United States. Lyndon Johnson was trying to manage the military operations in Vietnam from the White House. Needless to say, he didn't do very well. Conditions on the ground change rapidly. Okay. Hierarchical control is fragile. It's susceptible to any break in the chain. Somebody, forgot, somebody forgets to pass on the signal. Well, in a factory, that happens all the time. If you have too long a chain of control, 
One signal doesn't get passed on. One signal fails. You get some noise in the system. The signal doesn't get passed on. You don't have the response. The decision maker is not familiar with local conditions. Okay? In other words, he's not equipped. The capability of that part or the capability of that molecule is not sufficient to control the rest of the system. Well, a cell would never be so stupid to use such a molecule. Okay? And hopefully, we'd build a factory wouldn't be so stupid to do so. Distributed control puts the control at the local level. In other words, the control is distributed throughout the entire system. Local decisions are being made all over the place. Okay? And somehow they have to be coordinated, but they're still being made locally. This is efficient, but it makes the system very hard to identify. It's the old, the old um, story of looking at the elephant. One person sees the tail, sees a snake. One touches the leg, he sees a, he sees a tree trunk. Excuse me if I did that wrong. I learned that when I was a small child. The point is, looking at things locally will not give you a good way to identify the whole system. This requires integration of the local conditions across the system. This is very hard for computer scientists. They struggle with this because they want to have distributed systems, because distributed systems have all these nice properties. But then they have to somehow make sure that there's integration of these local conditions over the whole system. Cells are wonderful. If we could just understand what they're doing, we, we would know what to do with our factories. Okay? They're just wonderful at it. Okay? As I said, it provides for efficient response to local events happening asynchronously. Asynchronicity almost requires locality. Okay? Almost requires locality. And many pathways are responding independently of other pathways. Now, the word independent here is a little, little slightly stretched out. They're not fully independent because the overall system is somehow under control. But they're essentially independent, so long as they don't get too out of line with what the system wants to do. Okay? Um, and we have a lot of trouble understanding that. I try to teach, uh, years ago I taught computer architecture in a previous lifetime. And I remember trying to teach parallel architectures. The students did not like it. They did not like it at all. Okay? Um, they wanted to go back to their sequential architectures. <laughs> and that's our problem. In, in biology, we don't deal with sequential architectures. Okay. Now, we need fault tolerance. It's critical. A system has to be redundant so it's fault tolerant. We have to have backup systems. We want the system to function in parallel manner. So if one, if one pathway gets shut down, another pathway picks it up. Okay. We want error correction. Apoptosis is a very good error correction. The cell dies. Okay. But we want to have ability for the cell to go on in the face of faults. Multiple pathways are required to achieve the same end. Why? Because we want to have parallelism. We don't want we don't want to be we don't want to die if one if one, if one source of this of, of, of uh, signal goes down. Okay, but this makes it very difficult to infer from infer from data because different pathways will be operating depending on the context of the system. You can't just look at the system under one context, make your conclusions, and then use them under some other context. This requires very careful experimental design. Now think of high throughput uh, methods. That, that let's say take uh, measure expression. Do they do this? No. They just take data which has been collected from various patients. Okay. There's no effort to achieve experimental design to in order to figure out what's going on with these pathways. Okay. That data is essentially useless. There's also autonomous reconfiguration. The operational logic changes depending on condition. Now this is a very smart computer system. Does this, okay? This is called an intelligent computer system. Cells are intelligent in this regard. They can reconfigure. You knock out something, you knock out a, a, a gene, the cell goes on as if you didn't do anything. Okay? It reconfigures itself to carry out all its functions. A smart computer system and a smart factory. You heard the word smart factory, it can do this. It can do this. Maybe at a slight loss of efficiency. Slight loss of efficiency but often hardly noticeable. Okay. Now, here's my old slide again. Parallel pathways. If you look at this slide, there's RAS sitting in the middle of it. Okay. You want to get down here to these different uh, uh, proliferation, survival signals. You can come in this way. You can come in that way. And this is a small diagram. It's just an example of all the ways in which you can come up to the system to get down into here. Okay. Many parallel pathways. And this is typical of what you're going to see in these kind of uh, uh, diagrams. 
Now, what is a self-organizing system? Essentially, what we're talking about here. In 65, these systems were being studied, both in the US and in the Soviet Union. And uh, Pugachev was in the Soviet Union. And he was a control theorist. And, he, and, he, and I have this quote from his book, one of his books on control. Self-organizing system are control systems capable of analyzing their own operating conditions to produce an optimum performance. The simplest systems of this type, which incorporate elements for automatically adjusting particular parameters according to the analysis of input and output data, are called self-adjusting systems. Otherwise, the system looks at its own performance and adjusts its performance accordingly. Okay? There are feedback loops all over the place. And what do you see in a cell? Massive feedback. Massive feedback. Okay? Complex systems of this kind are capable of adapting themselves completely at each instant to the results of their analysis of external conditions and previous performance. In other words, they can change their logic. These are said to be self-organizing systems. Okay? If you look at Waddington and you look at biology understood from that perspective, you see that he was right on the mark at exactly the right time. These systems were being developed in the 40s, the 30s and 40s. Okay? Had biology gone the way of Waddington, it would have been much more successful because it had all the tools that were being developed to study such systems. However, it didn't go that way. It went a different way. And it's bypassed all this machinery which exists, vast amounts of machinery, to study such systems and, and represent such systems. Okay. Let's look at some examples. Let's look at uh, TP53. And, and so many of you know this, some of you don't. That's why I'm putting it out. Many of the biologists are surely aware of this, especially people who work in, uh, in cancer. It's a central hub in a network of various stress responses. I put, okay. I put a diagram before. It can activate an array of responses, but is not required for the occurrence of such responses. That's what's critical. It can activate responses, but it's not required. They can be, they can be activated other ways. Okay, other ways. Okay. That's critical to keep that in mind. So think about the experimental problems here. This creates experimental difficulties. Responses can occur in the absence of TP53, even though when TP53 is present, it drives these responses. In other words, when it's active, it drives the responses. When it's not active, the responses can also be by taken over, by controlled by other regulatory system structures. Okay? Now, this is the key line here if you think about experiments. In shifting from simple, linear, context-independent, not highly branched regulatory relationships to those that are complex, nonlinear, context-dependent, redundantly represented, and both highly branched and interpenetrating, one must take into account the vastly increased number of ways a process can be configured. Okay. That's Mike Bittner's line in the book. I didn't credit for writing that one. Think of the experimental difficulties here. Any kind of naive, thoughtless experiment of just collecting data is never, ever going to get near any of this. Okay? You've got to go back to those wonderful biological experiments that used to be done 50 years ago. You're going to have to think about these models and design experiments to get at these kind of relationships. There's nothing to do with correlation. Correlation is irrelevant. It's meaningless. Okay. Now let's look at one of my favorite topics, canalization. This is an example of what I just talked about. In a factory, okay, or cell, Special logic canalizes a portion of the system into a reconfigured state of operational control, which Pugachev was talking about. Okay? The critical control will be completely missed unless the system is observed under the threat. In other words, if you observe, if you run the experiment under the threat that this response is taking, is taking place for, you will see it. If you don't, you will not see it. The system has been altered temporarily to deal with a stress response. This concept was introduced by Waddington back in the 30s. Analyzation. I think it was the 30s. There may not be strong correlation between a canalizing gene and its subordinates. Why? Because when the canalizing gene is downregulated, which is most of the time, the system is not under threat, its slaves are free to react to other regulatory elements. So if you look for correlation, you're not going to find it. Because most of the time, the system is not under the control of the canalizing gene. It's operating independently of that gene. But yet, when that gene is activated to, to handle a stress response, it's totally controlled by that. You must do experiments to elucidate that control. If you don't do experiments to do that, you're not going to see it. You can do the correlations, and you're going to get low correlation. And then you're going to assume these, these genes have nothing to do with each other. 
Okay? When in fact, the catalyzer gene is a complete master of those genes under certain conditions. Okay? Let's look at DUSK1, one of our favorite genes. Catalyzing genes are often found in signaling pathways. Now, that's natural, what I just said. That deliver information from a variety of sources to the machinery that enacts central cellular functions such as cell cycle, survival, apoptosis, and metabolism. Why? Because when you have key functions which you must have to exist, you better have the stress response mechanisms to deal with that. You better have the emergency machine ready to save you. Okay. Right? This is standard in a factory. Standard in the computing system to avoid catastrophic failure. Computer systems are set up to avoid catastrophic failure. Okay? And so are cells. Thus, one antagonizes the activity of the P38 mitogen activated kinase map, whoop, map and APK1. It's a central component of the pathway by which extracellular signal regulated kinases send mitogenic signals. Thus, one is catalyzing this phospho in its phosphorylated state and is catalyzing when it dephosphorylates MAPK1. Otherwise, it's not catalyzing. So what happens to you, if you don't see it in its catalyzing state, you will not know that it's catalyzing. And we've done a lot of experiments with dust one. Okay? One gets the feeling that he's in a very sophisticated computer science uh, a program when he's looking at the behavior of this guy. But extremely sophisticated. Okay? Why has he developed this way? He's developed this way for survival. Without this kind of mechanism, the cell would not be survival, survivable. Okay? One of the things you have to realize when you think about biology is that everything is oriented towards survivability and procreation, of course. Okay? Life must continue and be passed on. If you, look at a, if you forget that you're looking at a living organism whose goal is to live, whose goal is to live, if you forget that, you're going to miss the point. And, and that's what Waddington was trying to emphasize. Everything has to be studied relative to that goal. And that's why such genes are there. Okay? At least we believe that's why they're there. What are the implications of this mathematics? There are huge implications. Once a factory exceeds a very small number of interconnected components, which all modern factories do, coordinating its operations goes beyond the common sense non-mathematical approach. You don't have a bunch of guys running around taking measurements in the factory anymore. That stopped a long time ago. The factories are controlled by, by computers with constantly sensing everything that's going on. Okay? There are no humans. There's no human interaction. Okay? The system has to be looked at in, in its entirety on a continuous basis. Two basic operational issues concerning a factory characterization and control of its operations. Both require a suitable conceptualization. Okay? So you have basic issues are the characterization and the control of its operations. You have to characterize the factory, and you have to have its control, and you have to understand its control, control it, okay? If you don't have these both in hand, you can't go on. Obviously, you must characterize it first, but if you don't have a complete description of the control, you can't possibly be checking the factory. Now, we have an advantage with the factory. We built it, okay? That's why engineering is much easier than biology, because we built the factory, okay? You didn't build a cell. Makes it much harder. Conceptualization must be mathematical. Why? Mathematics provides a relational language. It is the language of relations. That's what mathematics describes, relations. Mathematics provides a language in which complexity can be represented in such a way as to be amenable to analysis. Ordinary language cannot deal with complexity. We can deal with climbing a tree, throwing a rock, and beating an animal over the head with a club and then eating it. That we can deal with, with our common sense. Much beyond that, we can't do. And if you don't think I'm right, look at politics. That's about the level they can do. Okay? Beating an animal over the head with a club. Okay? When it comes to running a complex factory, we have, need mathematics. Okay? Complex systems beyond, are beyond ordinary intelligibility and intuition. Nobody actually often knows what's going on in the factory at any given moment. Only the machinery knows what's going on, okay? But of course, we built that machine. What are the implications of biology? Well, you can imagine. Given that cellular control appears similar to factory control, but in a much more complex environment, 
Progress in biological science will require adopting the same systems, methods, and engineering as already found useful and necessary in dealing with complexity. I think I can make that statement definitively, and I would be glad to debate anyone who disagrees with it, because, in fact, the situation is even worse with cells than with factories. The roles of regulatory logic in the factory are complex machine, and the cell are congruent because the key, to the, the key to the characterization of this logic lies in communication between the components okay, and control of the components. A cell's components are constantly in communication and are constantly under control. And the same with a factory. Can you imagine a factory where the components didn't communicate with each other? Okay? I mean, think of it. It would be like the Persian army when they fought the Greeks at Marathon. Every regiment spoke a different language. They were annihilated by one-tenth their number of that, okay? You have to have rapid communication. Why does the military spend so much money in communication? Think about it. They need rapid communications to coordinate activity, okay? So we have to have communication. The logic, uh, the characterization of this logic lies in communication and control. That is in systems theory. Once you say communication and control, you're in a theory of systems. And therefore, that determines the epistemology of the cell. This is one of the conclusions of our book that the logic forces us to go into systems theory, and therefore that determines the way we need to understand the structure of the cell, as opposed to chemistry or physics. We are leaving physics, we are leaving chemistry, we're in a new subject called biology. And that subject lies in systems theory. And here's the quote, 1948, from Wiener, who recognized this early on. He wrote in Cybernetics, as far back as four years ago, the group of scientists about Dr. Rosenbluth, who was his uh, colleague, and myself had already become aware of the essential unity of the set of problems centered about communication, control, and statistical mechanics, whether in a machine or a living tissue. Wiener recognized this um, because he knew both systems theory and, 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 and bio some bio Rosenbluth was the biologist. So they worked together. Waddington didn't realize it because he didn't know systems theory. But if you read Waddington, it's obvious. Okay. Any, any occur, just reading Waddington tells you you're in systems there. Okay. And so this is the issue. This is where the epistemology of the cell lies. Okay. Now, what does that mean about knowledge? How does that, what, what, we, what, is our, what form is our knowledge going to take? Biology studies relations between molecules, not, not the molecules or the forces between them. In other words, the relations, the control, the communication. Okay. Biological knowledge concerns regulatory logic and the consequent intracell operational organization of molecular structures as well as the intracell organization. All about communication and control. That's what it's all about. Okay. I, I, got, I think Waddington had an advantage. I mean, Waddington was working with development. I mean, he was a developmental biologist to a great extent. And he was looking at how organisms develop. And he recognized they were under control. I mean, if you think about it, he recognized the control. And the quiz problem was, how am I going to get at that control? OK. This recognition facilitates the answers to two fundamental epistemological questions. What form does biological knowledge take? And how is biological knowledge validated? What's its form, and how do we validate it? Okay. So if, you read, if you're going to work in biology, what should it look like? And then there's the problem of validation. What about its form? Well, I don't. It, that's a hard question. Uh, this relates to the type of mathematics involved in modeling the relations that characterize regulatory knowledge. In other words, the form will be the relations that you require to, to characterize those that communication and control. It depends upon the nature of the relations being considered. There can be many, many different types of mathematics, depending on what you're actually looking at. The general mathematical framework will be formed within the theory of stochastic multivariate dynamical systems. Okay. And that's a wide theory. That's why we can't be specific about any particular thing. That depends upon the particular problem. But that wide theory, the fact that it's dynamical, stochastic, and multivariate, that we're assured of. Okay. That we're assured of. How is biological knowledge validated? Again, nice answer. It depends. <laughs> it depends upon the mathematical model constituting the biological knowledge. In other words, you have to have an ingenious experimentalist to understand that system and figure out what kind of experiments he's going to do. OK? Not a simple question. It's hard validating systems. Validation will involve operational predictions derived from the mathematical regulatory model. Well, until I have the model, until I have an experimentalist 
who can actually construct the apparatus to do that, I'm not going to be able to validate it. Okay? And that's a hard problem. If you lose the ability to construct experiments because you spend your time doing data mining, you will never be able to validate anything. Okay? You must spend your time doing experiments. And that is key. Okay? The, experiment, the experimentalist must do experiments. So what does our system look like? Well, if you want to simulate such a system, what you have is you have a lot of inputs, and you have some logic, and then you take the and that logic will predict the outcome uh, that can predict what the variable you want to predict. Now, in fact, there's lots and lots of other variables that you can't measure or can't control because the system has lots of latent variables. So it's a rather tricky matter to figure out how am I going to build a system to make predictions when I know and when I know in fact there's lots and lots of other variables I can't get my hands on. Okay, this is what makes the thing stochastic. You might have a very nice deterministic logic making predictions, but in fact, this becomes valuable because of all the other behavior which you can't observe. We call it noise. I don't like the word noise. It's not noise. It is the function of non-observed variables in the system. Okay? And so trying to derive, trying to create such mathematical systems and to build experiments concerning such systems is not an easy problem. Not at all. Very hard problem. Variables which are not inside. Suppose, you, suppose you're looking at, suppose you're building a model with 12 genes, but in fact there may be 20 or 30 other genes which are related to those 12. They're not in your model. So as they change, your model is going to appear to be, it, it, it's going to appear to change. It's going to appear that instead of your model being deterministic, it's going to appear to random because their behavior is going to change the, the, the behavior of your own model, and the data will look random. So a lot of times we see people say, "Oh, there's noise." Gaussian noise or some noise. No, it's not noise. It, it, it's actually the, cause, it's, it's the result of these latent variables which are operating outside the system. And the, the experimentalist has to try to design experiments to mitigate that. I mean, I mean, what's the classic role of the experiment? Try to set up conditions in which these other latent variables don't affect the output of the system too much so I can get a read on what's going on with the variables I'm interested in. Okay? That's why cell lines are easier to work with than humans. Okay. We have a lot less latency. Right? So the, the critical issue is how do I design these experiments? What you're not going to do or ever want to do is to measure 30,000 genes and record their expressions. That, you never want to do that. that just, that's madness. Okay? I've done such madness in the past. Okay? Um, it's madness because I have no idea. I, I then use it. I'll come back to this in my sixth lecture. You're going to use some method called feature selection then to find out the variables of interest. But feature selection doesn't work very well when you have lots of variables. You're better off trying to conceptualize the system first, build a careful experiment focused on the variables you want to look at, and suppress the activity of the, of the other latent variables. Classical experiment. Classical biological experiment. Okay? Nothing new in making, I'm making that statement. Okay? Multivariate, now I'm going to do a little bit of math here, but not too much. Multivariate predictive relations are key. In other words, we want to be able to look at certain genes and predict the, eff the, the effects. We want to be able to measure factors, look at those factors, and predict effects. That's what we want to be able to do. That's, that's part of what the operational problem of science is. So one of the interesting problems we looked at is the following. Suppose you have a master gene controlling a bunch of other genes. Let's say some gene controls several pathways. Activation of this gene or deactivation controls those pathways. Okay? So if you know the value of the master, you can then maybe predict the slaves. You can look at the master and predict the slaves. Let's go with the slaves. But you also can look at the slaves and predict the master. And that's one of the most interesting problems. Because I want to get at the behavior of the master. I look at its slaves, and I turn out I can predict the behavior of the master by watching its slaves. If you don't believe me, watch a horse run very fast. It's likely somebody that the, the driver is hit, you know, motivated him to move. Okay? So I look at the slaves. And The method we use is called the coefficient of determination. And this measures, I'm not, this measures the relative decrease in prediction error when using the predictor genes in comparison to predicting the target gene in the absence of predictor genes. In other words, if I look at a particular gene, it's going to have some variability, and I, and I can try to predict what it's going to be by its average, let's say. But if I look at some other genes which are predictors, I should get a better, a more, a more accurate prediction of its behavior. So the increase in accuracy of predicting it by these other genes, then just looking by itself 
That's called the coefficient of determination. It's a relative measure. It's you take the error of predicting the target by itself, minus the error when you can predict it with all these other guys observing it, and then you, you normalize by the error of itself. And so basically, this COD value goes from 0 to 1. When it's 1, it means the predictors are basically controlling exactly the, the, the predictive gene. If it's 0, it means the predictors are giving you no value. And in reality, there's always going to be between somewhere in 0 and 1. Okay? And if I look at the slaves predicting, the, when the slaves predict the, the, the master, then the master um, won't be to perfectly predicted by the slaves because there are other guys regulating the slaves. I mean, I can't get perfect prediction, but I can get pretty good prediction if the master is a, a, a strong controller. Okay. But there's a, lot, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of subtleties here. Okay. Let's look at, and I can't go into all of them, unfortunately. Let's look at an experiment we did about 10 years ago. I'm using it because we have some very nice slides for it. Genotoxic stress experiment. We have, a, we have blood assays in 12 cell lines, stimulated with ionizing radiation, IR, a chemical mutagen, MMS, or ultraviolet radiation. So these are the various stimulants we're going to use. Okay? We have both P53 proficient and P53 deficient cells in the assay, as we were looking at P53. And this is from a pa an old paper, around 2000. This was probably the first paper um, ever using um, a, a gene expression to look at regulation. Of, uh, you know, based upon microarrays. Okay. Um, what? Um, the data was ternary. It was logical. Minus one, zero, or one. Down, regulated. Um, I can't read the yellow and upregulated. Um, an algorithm calculates the data internally in each microarray and statistically determines whether the data justifies the conclusion that the expression is up or down at 99% confidence. Okay. Um, this is an old algorithm we developed back around 1997. It was the first such algorithm. The need for many samples where gene expression levels vary due to altered state, cellular states. You have many samples. You need them. You need lots of samples because you need to be able to see these changes. Okay. Now, here's the kind of data you get. Um, you have the rows or cell lines subjected to different experimental conditions. These are cell lines, and, these are, and, and, and they have different. Here's, here's one cell on MO1. And the conditions either IR or MMS. So these various cell lines have been, each cell line has been give, has subjected to a different stimulation. Okay? Um, minus one expression goes down relative to untreated. Ex zero expression means expression unchanged relative to untreated. One means it goes up relative to untreated. And we use green, red, and yellow to represent these conditions. And these are the various genes running down way, way over here. Okay? There were 500 of them at the time. Okay? Now, we're looking for relations. We're trying to compute the COD. Now, if the COD is near 1, we have a strong predictability. And if the COD is near 0, you don't get you have no predictability. Now, we were able, when we, we measured the COD for P53, which was our interest, predicting MDM2, which we know is related to it, okay? What do we get? We got about 0.5. All right. The biological expectation would be that MDM2 would be incompletely but strongly predicted by P53. If you go back to that diagram I showed on that long ago, that's exactly what that diagram said. You should expect some um, prediction, but not, but not complete. Okay? Additions of further genes to P53 do not increase the accuracy of the prediction. In other words, put more genes from that set of genes we looked on, it doesn't help you predict MDM2. P53 was a good predictor. Okay? Now, what about over here? It is known that P53 is influential but not determinative of both the upregulation of both P21 and MDM2. This is a much more interesting diagram. Okay? Some level of prediction of P53 should be possible by a combination of what? MDM2 and P21. Now, here's what's interesting. If you try to predict P53 by MDM2, you only get 0.26. That's not a very high level. If you try to predict it by P21, you only get 0.2, which is not a very high level. But if you use them in combination, you're up to 0.45, which is fairly strong. Because remember, we had P53 proficient, and we had both. We had, we had some, we had some, some uh, microarrays where P53 was important and some where it was not. Okay? And so that was a pretty strong uh, number there. For, and we had a lot of randomness, a lot of noise. Back in those days, the no in fact, this may have all been noise back in those days. I, I know, okay? We had so much noise. But anyway, you see the combination gives you more predictive capability. Now, what's the problem with biology? It's not so simple. That worked exactly like you would have thought. Now you go to a more interesting problem. 
We were predicting ATF3. You could, if you tried to predict it with PC1, no essential predictive capability whatsoever. If you try to predict it with IR, ionizing radiation, tells you nothing, zero prediction. But when you put these two together, you can predict it at 0.6 COD. That tells you that if you're going to look for correlations of individual, for individual non-multivariate relations, you could get really, really hurt. Okay? And this is what is going on throughout the cell. No predictability, one at a time, multivariate, very high. And in this data set, given the way we constructed this data set and the amount of noise in it, this was a very high number. Okay, very high number. And this is trouble. And, I, and there are loads, we see this all the time, all the time. Now, let's try to predict the catalyzing gene. Okay, this is a fun game. A key characteristic of a catalyzing gene is its ability to override other regulatory instructions. I told you, when the catalyzing gene is active, it just overrides everything else. It takes over. It becomes a dictator. Okay? This results in a considerable change in predictability of the controlling gene by those it controls, obviously. Okay? When not activating, the controlling gene will not be well predicted by the subjects because it doesn't, doesn't, they don't care about it. When the controlling gene is active, its behavior may not be well predicted by any one of its targets, but can be very well predicted by groups because it controls large groups. And if the key is that it can control a large group. So we have a double difficulty here. Okay? Let us consider the, C the binary COD of X1 and X2 predicting Y. What happens when you take two genes trying to pick one, assuming that Y is catalyzed? Okay? Now comes the fun. What we define, we, put up, we made a definition. We call imp gene. A pair of genes, and it could be three genes, four genes. I'm doing the two here, but in general, it's more complicated. Okay? But it's, I don't want to make a big mathematical mess here. A pair of genes is intrinsically multivariate predictor. For another gene, Y, with respect to lambda and delta, those are two parameters. Okay? If the maximum COD individual predictive capabilities is less than lambda, but together they predict greater than delta. In other words, individually they're very small, less than lambda. Their lambda is 0 0.1, 0 0.2. But together, they're very predictive. Let's say delta is 0.8. That's the game I just showed you. Now, this extends to more complicated scenarios, OK? Here's an example. OK, a dust one induced change in MAPK1 phosphorylation, phosphorylation status is expected to have a very significant effect on the abundance of the transcripts of many genes. We know that because that makes dust one in a catalyzing state. I, I mentioned that before, OK? So now dust one is catalyzed. So I should expect that this should give me control of lots of genes. Okay. okay. Well, let's see what happens. Here we have a data set with 31 samples, 587 gene expression measurements. Of the 31 samples, 19 are normal and 12 are melanoma. Okay. Now, of course, the sample size is small, so you have to be careful, but the results are still pretty striking. Okay. Lambda is 0.2, okay, and we tried delta 0.7 to 0.8. 8.8 is very high, very high. And 0.2 is low. Okay? It means almost no predictability. Thus, one has the most, of all these genes, thus one has the most imp predictor pairs. 176 different pairs of genes for delta greater than 0 0.7 and 19 for 0 0.8. These are extremely high numbers. So there are lots of pairs which individually cannot predict thus one, but together can predict it very highly. That's the sign of a catalyzing gene. One of the signs. There's other signs. That's one of the signs. The extent of dust one's control is enormous. 21 different genes appear in the 19 predictor pairs for 0, 0.2 and 0.8. 21 different genes have this multiple predictive capability with dust one. It's a lot in that small sample that we're involved with. Particularly striking examples. RTN1 and TND, they can, together can predict dust perfectly. But individually, zero. Okay? Another example. It's the next example. Okay? There are many examples like this. You essentially have no predictability, and together you have high predictability. Okay? Now, if you try to design an experiment by, where you don't observe dust one in a catalyzing state, or you should mix them up by taking a bunch of patients without looking to see the active state, 
the state of the cells you're looking at, what are you going to see? You're going to see nothing. You're going to see a nothing. Because you're only going to pick this up if you design an experiment to stress this gene and to force thus one into a canalizing state, which is what we do. We force them to canalize the state. Okay? If you don't do that, you're going to miss it. All right? So all these high throughput experiments looking at randomly taken patients from tumor tissues, a tumor tissue all from a bunch of hospitals, who has any idea? Not only that, the cells are all mashed together anyway. Okay? You don't know what you're looking at. You have no idea what you're looking at. Okay? You're groping in the dark. You are making, you, you're, you're taking Kant's terminology and giving an extreme case of groping in the dark. And, and, and this is not deniable. This is how biology works. This is how a factory works. When, when I came across coming into biology such behavior, I was not shocked because I had tried to deal with computer systems. Okay? And we are familiar with this kind of behavior. Whenever you have locality and fault tolerance, Okay? This is what you get. Okay? This is what you get. Okay? You don't look at correlations. Okay? Now, here's a dustborn network. Now, I, I, I can I, You have the slide I, on, on the web. You can look at the slide more carefully, okay? Um, I have dustborn controlling this, uh, this, this uh, pathways. It exerts strong control over the downstream genes, uh, VD phosphorylation and VRK. One, two, so let that go. You can look at this, okay? I'm not going to go through the details of the slide. Still enough time, okay? We have, a, we have a new other way of measuring catalyzing power. In fact, we have introduced a new measurement of catalyzing power. And it's in a paper which isn't out yet. It's in, it's in press. And we took a large set, we took that entire network. This is a real, I mean, this is a network which we developed at TGen. The, the network itself is not just made up out of nowhere. It's been developed at TGen by different experimental conditions and looking at different pathways, okay? So we're, we're quite confident that it's at least active to some extent. Okay? And we computed, and we have a method to look at this pathway, these pathways, using what we call a Bayesian network. And we have a, a measure of canalizing power. And here are the genes. Thus, one scored 13. Nothing else is near it. It's very strongly catalyzing compared to anything else in this network. I, I can't go into I'll give it to you mathematically, but it's, it's very messy. Okay? The reason I stuck with the COD is it's a little easier. This is a more complicated definition. It, it's, okay. Now, what are the implications here? What are the implications for experimental design? I, I have been constantly talking about experiments now. You must be tired of hearing me use the word experiments, okay? But there's really nothing new here. The scientist approaches an experiment with a conceptualization of the system operation. If you don't approach an experiment like that, you're not going to be able to do an experiment. Read Waddington and read Waddington's experiments. Okay? They are approached with a, a conceptualization of what he's looking to see. In other words, in Wiener's terminology, a precise question. Okay? Look at other, other many great experiments. Look at uh, Minot's experiment. Okay. These experiments are done very carefully with the, the intent to get at some information within the system which he has already conceptualized. Okay. Now, what are the... Well, how do I do this? I mean, what, what's the structure behind this conceptualization? It's based upon the required functionality of the system. The cell must survive. It must respond to stress. It has to adapt. Because it has all these requirements for functionality, that, that, tells you, that gives you part of the conceptualization, and it limits the possible relationships between the variables. You don't have some unknown network you're going to somehow fill in some statistical model by data. That's not, any, that's not there. This thing already has a, can be conceptualized in terms of its functionality. And then you have to build estimate parameters in the system, and then you have to adjust the equations and the relationships as you get more data. But the mind has created the system. It's a product of mind. Okay? It's not mindless. Right? The scientist has created the system. Um, if you look at Galileo, he didn't see inertia in his measurements. Okay? You have to create the understandings, the, the conceptualizations that you're going to use. 
and they can differ as time goes on, depending on as you learn more about the systems. Okay? They're not fixed in time. They move. Your models develop. They get more systematic. You go to Newtonian laws to Einsteinian laws. Okay? Doesn't mean Newton's laws were bad. It just means that at that point there was no. They were they, they were functional. They seem to, in fact, they did characterize what was then observable. Okay? But then anomalies arose. And a new conceptualization has to be developed to test it. Okay? This leads to a precise interrogation of nature. Because you're trying to answer specific questions about the conceptualization. And critically, for practical matters, it constrains the inference problem and therefore the experimental complexity. If you, as, these, as the system, conceptualization, conceptualization becomes more and more vague and imprecise, the inference problem becomes more difficult, and you require more and more data, and you have enormous complexity. Let's try to get at it. You bring that down. You bring that down to a manageable thing which is involved with how you conceive the system. Okay. Absent preconceived questions, one returns to pre-Galilean science. You're back to groping in the dark. Okay? Data mining is an example of pre-Galilean science. I wouldn't even call it science. It's our, it might be Aristotelian. I'm, I don't want to insult Aristotle. Okay? That is not science. That is not the pursuit of science. Because if you're looking at 30,000 variables, and you have not designed an experiment, and you're just going to measure 30,000 variables, Aristotle, I'm sure, would never condone such a thing. Okay? He had too much common sense. He was the common sense philosopher. Okay? That requires an enormous loss of common sense. Okay? One has to move outside the realm of, of almost sanity okay? to conceive that you're going to solve problems that way. We have known this. We have known this since Francis Bacon. Okay? We have known this since 1620. It is amazing that after success, of science for 350 years, three and a half centuries of success, okay, of careful experimental design and structured model, that somehow a group of people would come along and say, no, they're all wrong. We're going to do. We're going to go back to groping in the dark. We think groping in the dark is the way to go. And then suddenly billions of dollars are spent groping in the dark. People are given tenure groping in the dark. It's an amazing thing if you think about. And they have produced nothing. Okay? All right? That's the point. Careful statistical inference for model based structures is how we have to go. Ronald Fisher knew this 80 years ago. He talked about this problem. Okay? And so if we think about the cell, the epistemology of the cell, we see the functionality in terms of these various requirements for survivability. And as we see in a factory, okay, so we have already a network of relationships that have been studied for over half a century. Okay, all we need to do, or, or our first cut, is to take those relationships and now utilize them with biology. Now, of course, factories are simpler than cells. We know that. Okay, we know that, but they at least provide a starting point. The functionality provides a starting point. You know. My close colleague, Mike Bittner, has told me that the one thing he's learned over all his years of, of biology is he's been trying to control cells his whole lifetime. And he says the one thing is they don't like to be controlled. They don't like to be told what to do. Okay. But it's in trying to deal with them and trying to basically outsmart them, if you will, that you're going to understand what they're about. You're not going to do it by mashing them up, taking a bunch of chemicals, and correlating chemicals. Because where is the livingness in that system? Where is the livingness? The livingness is the biology. Okay. And that will lead to solutions. That will lead to solutions. Um, what I'll talk about in my next two talks, I think this is the last slide. Yeah. Um, not that one. What I'll talk about in my next two talks, um, I'll talk about networks. Next week, I'll talk about how we, looking at biological, how we model networks, how we try to get, get networks from data and, and knowledge, how we constrain networks, what are the complexity issues. And then in the next lecture, if that, I'll talk about how do we control networks? How do we intervene? That's the medical problem.
how do we take oh, the translational problem? How do we take regulatory networks once we have constructed them and come up with uh, strategies for treatment? Okay? What we'll see is that those treatment strategies are, cannot be naive. They're complicated because they have to take into account the complex functioning of the network. If you try to derive, if you try to make up these, inter, these treatments by, by ad hoc, by just thinking about them, you're not going to get close. You're not going to be close to anything. Okay? You're going to have to take into account all this feedback that's going on, all this redundancy, all this parallelism. Nobody could figure this out in his head. That's out of the question. And no one's going to get anywhere by screening zillions and zillions of compounds, because you'll need many, many zillions of zillions of compounds. Okay? Because the interactions are so complicated, you need to construct these models, derive from the models, the top of treatment strategies, and then try to produce them. Okay. That requires the interaction, as I'll talk about in my last talk on translational science, this is going to require the cooperation of engineers and biologists and computer scientists and statisticians. It's going to require that kind of teamwork to do this problem. Okay. It's, not going to, it's, and it's not going to happen without that. So my last lecture will be getting down to that. How do we actually put this together? Uh, the, which we have not done yet. Not been accomplished yet. That's it.